I would like to basically share with you the experience that I had in with two years basically of deliberation within I told you that I was a member of this uh, economic uh, ethical economic and social council committee of, of the high council on biotech and we had two years basically of deliberation which means more or less it was one one meeting every month so it's more or less 30 hours of discussion with multiple point of view. I told you we were a group of 30 people, more or less, uh, in that council. So coming from only France, but from all different kind of stakeholders, distribution, consumer, uh, research organization. Um, and we had to investigate, basically, that was the request of the government, whether uh, so let's uh, oh, here a series of question uh, uh, basically where general meditic product fits in existing regulatory framework and basically here it was mainly uh, whether it fits in the directive 2001-18 of the EU I will not enter in those details of for purely legal but uh, um, are these regulatory framework adapted to this new technology and the innovations uh, derived from it? Is the risk-based assessment, as, the as I said this morning, as the predominant governance approach for emerging, uh, for, for emerging te uh, technology is still relevant? And do we need to come up with a new governance approach, a new regulatory framework? So at the end, all those questions boils down to basically three topics that I will present kind of overview and we'll have time in our group tomorrow to go further into the details of that. So I will just introduce to the controversies and the, the, the issue around those three points, which is what should we govern? Should we, and we've heard already this morning about that. Is it the process or the product? We have already some discussion with Daniel's presentation and even uh, with um, Christophe this morning. Who should govern that? What kind of mechanism? What kind of institution? What kind of group? What kind of process to put in place? Implementation process? So, um, uh, and then, how? How should we govern? I, I've mentioned several times this risk-based assessment as a major tool. Uh, and there are, we've heard also that there are also some regulations that are based on socioeconomic assessment. and there may be also other kind of criteria that uh, need to uh, be included for the regulation of uh, uh, gene edited uh, product. So let's start with uh, first the what. What should we govern? So if we start from the broader one, which is the definition of uh, uh, a living modified organism mm -hmm. as uh, proposed by the Biosafety Cartagena Protocol, uh, a living, uh, uh, a living modified organism means uh, any living organism that possesses a novel combination of genetic material obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. Which means, in this definition, basically, GMOs are defined through the process by which they have been obtained, basically, modern biotechnology. That's remained very vague, obviously, but here the question is, that genome editing technology challenges this definition due to the fact that, and we discussed already that this morning, the targeting technology is not involved in the trait production uh, by opposition to the transgenesis where you have a direct insertion uh, of a, a foreign sequence in your end product. Here we saw, we've heard that this is not uh, necessarily the case and you can get rid of the, the, the foreign element in your end product and at the end come up with an end product that is quite similar to what you could have obtained through other classical quote, quote, unquote, uh, selection methods. So that's basically uh, the, the situation which led to precisely revisiting this idea that maybe, you know, it's not such a good idea 
for that kind of product to, uh, to base uh, our criteria on the process and rather uh, focus on the product. So you would find tons of opinion paper, uh, uh, scientist paper arguing that a new, that basically regulation need to be edited. That's the, <laughs> the kind of uh, thing that you will need to be edited to fit to this new technology uh, uh, and this uh, new reality uh, to uh, uh, basically better match with uh, the, uh, the progress of, uh, of the technology. So product or process based, where do we stand? And here, I, I mean, we've already covered that this morning with the slide of Daniele. So you would find a uh, process based approach that differentiate the regulatory system uh, uh, according to the technology used. And um, it's basically based on these ideas that it's the technology that brings uncertainty that characterize the product and not the product. And then you have product base where basically, and we've heard also that this morning, regulation of plant variety based on, uh, the regulation of plant variety should be based on their specific agricultural trait, the phenotype, and not on the technical process. And we saw that Canada, uh, among the, the, the country who have uh, uh, adopted such a, it's probably the one who uh, went uh, the further uh, on that kind of approach. Um, and but the th actually, the, the situation is a bit more confused. Uh, I mean, not that simple in the sense that actually a lot of existing regulation are are using both uh, uh, product and process-based approach, including USA, where you have uh, um, uh, a kind of more uh, product-oriented approach, but still uh, this is remain true as long as they are developed, the product, without the use of a plant pest as the donor or vector, and they are not themselves plant pests. So there are still some exemptions uh, built in uh, existing regulation in uh, the US that may change, but this is still the case. And uh, in the EU uh, Directive 2001-18, here the definition of GMO introduced probably even more confusion, but it means an organism with the exception of human being in which the genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally. But then where there are some uh, uh, confusion is that Although uh, random mutagenesis clearly uh, fits in that definition, it has been exempted because, of, uh, because it has been used for uh, so many times now in the beginning of last century that it has been considered as safe. Uh, and uh, we uh, um, basically, uh, the same way than what is used for product uh, evaluation, there are still use of this uh, substantial uh, equivalence principle at, in, uh, at the assessment phase. So we can see that the situation is quite uh, confused with, uh, and there is not such a kind of uh, clear cut uh, um, kind of uh, division between uh, product and, and process base. And things are even more co uh, confused by the fact that to justify the, the, the argument of those who would like to shift to product base, actually, Sometimes they even use process-based argument to say, for instance, that the technology is so precise now that we, we don't need anymore to uh, care about the, the process. So the, the, there is a constant back and forth between process-based argument and product-based, and it's not that easy to build that so clearly, although some countries have done that in Canada, uh, that kind of uh, distinction. So now, uh, on the who. Uh, here, again, no global consensus uh, on who should be governing. And here, the literature and existing experience show, you, show us that we have at least five different models of governance that are not necessarily, that could complement each other. One which is based only on, and we've heard also that this morning, self-regulation, basically. We rely on professional association to come up with their own policy and regulation, and it will be up to funding agency, up to journals, for instance, <coughs> to, uh, or to ethical board uh, for uh, uh, granting agency or for uh, the, 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 the research organization, 
to control whether those guidelines uh, established by those uh, scientists have been uh, uh, implemented. So that would be the self-regulation, and we have people defending that kind of approach, saying that there is no reason to over-regulate, and we can trust the scientists who are the closest to the object to regulate to, to, to uh, come up with uh, what uh, uh, suits them best. Then you have the, as I said, the classical kind of approach that is quite uh, uh, spread out uh, uh, for any kind of emer emerging technology is this double delegation approach where scientists will de determine the acceptable risk and then it will be up to lawyer to come up with the, the, the um, to translate that into procedures and regulation. And that's exactly what happened with GMO in the EU, uh, obviously with people complaining about uh, the burdensome of that kind of uh, approach, but basically it's expert driven. Uh, then you would find uh, often as a kind of complementary approach to this expert driven, a kind of ethical legal expert committee established to, on a case by case, come up with more ethical, broader aspect related to uh, that technology. Another approach, which is exactly actually what we had with this committee in which I, I was taking part, which is this kind of multi-stakeholder consultation with this idea that there needs to be some deliberation with the, 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 the most concerned uh, stakeholder uh, actors uh, deal in charge or concern with the use of that technology. And then you have obviously other people that say that it requires also a broader public engagement through consensus conference, through uh, uh, any kind of consultation process that uh, 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 basically is established with the, the, the whole society whether this, is, uh, uh, this could work and could be really effective, it's another, uh, it's often quite uh, heavily criticized, but those are five kind of models of governance that uh, could be envisaged for in terms of uh, where decisions should be taken and who should be take those decisions. And then, obviously, there might be also some conflict about on what criteria we should base um, um, those decisions. And again, you will hear obviously a lot of people, and that's something that it's a kind of buzzword, and this everything has to be science based. But as I said this morning, what, what science is not very completely clear because there are multiple science, multiple ways of uh, considering one object with multiple disciplines, with multiple uh, scale and at a different scale, sorry. So science-based means almost nothing, but still it's something that come up constantly as a criteria for, uh, for, 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 for governance. Inclusiveness in terms of, uh, or in deliberation, inclusive means basically making sure that everybody uh, concerned has a, a say in that kind of decision. Deliberative that basically we, we, f we have space for people to argue and to exchange idea and to uh, build their kind of uh, 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 it's more this idea of a learning process through argumentation and socially robust would be another criteria it's basically the fact that it match with the, the needs of the, the society so those are kind of criteria important for governance aspect and then in terms of process now how to implement the decision that is made that it's uh, boils down to at least four kind of uh, uh, issues. One is what kind of information we ask to the one who are using that technology, what, what it needs to basically uh, give to the regulator uh, to uh, assess basically whatever needs to be assessed in, the, uh, in what has been decided. In, uh, so one is really about the information to be provided. The other, uh, and that's a a tough one, especially with the genome editing, is the coexistence, is how to manage the presence, for instance, very concretely, of edited product next to a field of a farmer who don't want to use edited, uh, genome edited product. 
So uh, that's uh, a, a very concrete uh, example since, for instance, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture has, uh, has taken a strong position saying that they are not uh, uh, ready to use uh, genome-edited product uh, seeds uh, for uh, organic, for producing organic. So what happened if uh, and how to manage concretely now, really at the practical level, the coexistence in one territory and in uh, in neighborhood field, uh, someone who uh, want to use and uh, the one who uh, doesn't want and who should it's so it's a technical issue because it's 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 it it means that we should be able to detect biological modification in and to see how it spread. Uh, it's also what information are again required by the the one selling genetic edited uh, product and whether there should be a registry of geni uh, genome edited uh, seeds for instance specific to the one that exists uh, uh, that exists so and also who should bear the cost of uh, uh, the that uh, the the the, the, the yeah, should bear the cost of this kind of uh, co the, the coexistence and the fact that ensuring that there is no contamination, although I mean with all the quote unquote of that uh, word, but um, that's uh, uh, basically the kind of discussion that we had about uh, coexistence. Then comes this issue of traceability and transparency. We've heard that it's very hard because to know uh, uh, whether. Um, uh, whether um, something has been obtained through uh, that method, and at least it's hard to detect it uh, using like uh, bi biological uh, uh, d detection. But we, 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 uh, it has been also noted that uh, things doesn't have to be biological, bio biologically detectable to be uh, labeled. There are things that are labeled out of on only documental uh, uh, traceability, uh, and that's, for instance, fair trade. Th there is no difference between a fair tra uh, a product uh, obtained uh, with fair trade and uh, another one. So it's just about claiming uh, a claim that has been, uh, in terms of, in that case, the, 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 the transaction and uh, uh, from, from an uh, economic uh, return to, 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 the, to the farmers. And we can imagine the same kind of approach for uh, for genome edited products, so the question of labeling is not necessarily tied to the question of uh, biological detection in, in terms of traceability. We can ensure other, t obviously, that would entail different type of monitor, uh, uh, different type of monitoring and control, and maybe allow more cheating. But at least it's it's not that it's impossible. Uh, and then monitoring, uh, and here uh, again, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, the question of uh, how to monitor to make sure that we keep collecting data on what happened in the field and to uh, monitor and to be able to uh, ensure longer term kind of uh, um, uh, sustainability or that kind of uh, 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 release of uh, such product. So those were the, the more or less the kind of uh, uh, discussion about the, the who and the, the in terms also of mechanism of implementation and now uh, comes the, the last point which is how and 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 here as as we also discussed at length already this morning we have kind of risk-based assessment of safety which in that case would be mainly based on biological criteria, and if you are pushing for product base, you will mainly assess the newness of the traits, of the traits as expressed phenotypically, within the species considered. And if you are more into the process kind of uh, approach, you will be looking at off-target effects and this kind of thing. So uh, that's basically uh, uh, the risk-based uh, assessment, but it's really, it has, and here it's really personal opinion, but also something that obviously came 
several times in our discussion with uh, the different groups, the fact that that kind of assessment is really based on the assumption. First, I've discussed the fact that it's based only on one kind of criteria, the biological one, and the fact that it's based on one scientific reasoning approach, which is probabil probabilistic. So it has some kind of self-limitation. But it, it's based also on the assumption that you can e that it's easy to classify outcome as positive or negative. It also does not account for more systematic uh, systemic effect in the uh, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> dynamic uh, uh, long term dynamic, the stacking of traits, the the, the contextual effect, and uh, also it continues to embed a kind of distinction between science and society. What? What uh, I, I mean by that is that basically, as we also discussed this morning, te a technology always operates within a context. And this context actually may impact much more for the efficiency of a, of a specific <coughs> technology than the technology itself, per se. So that's uh, uh, what needs also, at one point, to be included in the assessment to. Uh, at least assess also its uh, efficiency, its usefulness, and uh, and quite often is uh, at least it's in the classical risk-based assessment. This is not part of the picture. So, what are those other factors that are part of the picture in terms of context, the socio-economic factors? It's obviously, and we we'll discussed that the IP-related impact on competition, on public research. What are the consequences of that? What are the consequences in terms of coexistence of different production models? And I've mentioned the, the organic uh, uh, thing, and there are much more than that, obviously. The social acceptance, this idea that you need transparency and labeling because the consumer has the right to know. Um, and then you have also broader policy consideration, like food security. You won't give the same weight whether you consider that food security is an issue of increased food production, or whether it's a question of access to food, accessibility of, to, to food. If the later, then it's less the question of the relevance of a technic technological solution to fit the world that is at stake, but more a question of equity and redistribution. It's also a question of sustainability of a certain model of agriculture that relies exten extensively on non-renewable um, uh, energy, then the question of social inequalities, and this idea also of w whether uh, a path is reversible or not. What kind of lock-in effect and path dependency a certain technology leads us. So those are the kind of things that, and there are some framework of uh, assessment that have been developed in certain country, and including, I've actually chaired one of the uh, working group on socioeconomic consideration to provide also some, uh, let's say, criteria to uh, assess that uh, in a systematic way for, uh, in that case, it was GMO and not, uh, and not genome editing uh, uh, product. But as you see, this is something that uh, I, to my feeling, uh, gain more and more importance. And because that's probably where the main blockage actually are especially related to <coughs> genome editing. And we can decide not to face them, but it will hit back at one point if we don't uh, put that openly uh, and discuss those uh, issues. At least that's my opinion. Voila, so as a conclusion, so the <coughs> situation is far from being uh, consensual uh, at the international level. We see uh, on those three things, what, how, and who, uh, there seems to be quite a broad consensus among geneticists, but precisely this lack of agreement between uh, on, on those three things make it difficult to reach, I would say, beyond the ge this specific community uh, uh, and, again, call for probably uh, more discussion uh, uh, within a broader kind of, uh, just to talk about the scientific community. Uh, and. Say, okay, so that I, I, I already that mentioned that this morning. Science is not mono, uh, monolithic. Uh, the complexity of the problem makes it impossible for only one science to resolve the issue. So <coughs> we have to face 
<laughs> that and 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 take into account those plurality of scientific approach, of methods, of analytical scale. Um, and also, because also very often you will read that uh, there are facts that prove that and that, but facts are always framed, I mean, depend on the way you frame the question. So it's not that easy <coughs> to distinguish what is fact and what is value in that case. And um, that's why probably what we need, at least at this stage of basically uh, uh, where the technology is still uh, in this kind of infancy stage, to see governance more as an open-ended and collective learning process than, than rather than a means of implementation. So that would mean, again, putting more emphasis at this stage, and this is also part of what we are doing here in our very modest and, and, and way, obviously, but to basically try to increase mutual understanding among discipline, among people with different backgrounds to be able to uh, uh, have a kind of uh, uh, constructive uh, discussion about uh, that technology with the hope that this will help to have a more informed policy process and policy decision at the end of the day. And we are still far from that. so. Uh, we still have time, and take that time is, uh, taking that time is important to at this particular point of time. Voila. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm done. Yes.